Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, looking in the book of Revelations. I want to do a quick summary of a few of the chapters in Revelation. I want to show where we're at on this timeline that we call the Tribulation. Understanding how Matthew 24 says that we are right at the end of the beginning of sorrows. I want to jump up here in chapter 6. Now I want to start in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation because it's talking about the sixth seal. In fact, it's right there at the end of the sixth seal as the seventh seal is about to open. Now we understand that this is where we're at. We are in the sixth seal. We're right at the end of the sixth seal. And we understand that this sixth seal has been open since 1866. I repeat, it has been open since 1866. We've done several classes on this showing how there are scripture that tells us when the sixth seal was open. I do understand this is in conflict with the Left Behind movies and those that teach the Left Behind religion, as I call it. But you have to understand that scripture trumps a movie. I know that's hard for some to understand. Take my word for it. Scripture trumps any movie that you can see on such. And as the scripture tells us that we are in the sixth seal and that the sixth seal was opened in 1866, we have to go along with what the scripture says over any movie. I stress that because there's going to be people jumping down in the comment section and quoting from that movie over and over trying to convince people that that movie is the gospel. It's not. It is a very fictitious movie. I'm talking about that Left Behind series. Anyway, if you want to check out the classes that we've done based on scripture on the Sixth Seal, you can find some of those on our channel. I'll probably post a link to it in the end screens of this video and if you remind me I'll put it down there in the comment section or somewhere to let you guys see how we have scriptural proof that we're in the sixth seal right at the end of the sixth seal waiting for the seventh seal to be open and so that's where we'll start as chapter 6 talks about the seventh seal to be open this is where we're at now. We're actually waiting for the seventh seal to be opened. So let's look at some of these verses right here so we can see some of the stuff that we're expecting to take place here. Okay, so now let's jump all the way down here to verse 12 as chapter 6 talks about the sixth seal. And you see how it's talking about a great earthquake. But now, as we learned over in that class that I keep referring you guys to, we, this earthquake will happen at the end of the sixth seal. I know it's a bit confusing on how this wording implies that the earthquake will happen as he opened the sixth seal. But if you're not careful, you can also believe that the opening of this sixth seal could be a 24-hour event or a day-long event. Again, this seal has been open since 1866 and these events that's talking about here will happen at the end of this sixth seal. The sun becoming black like a sackcloth of hair and the whole moon become like blood. These are the very next events that we are actually waiting on here. We're waiting on this first earthquake. And we did a class not too long ago showing how there are actually two earthquakes in the Bible. One at the opening of the seventh seal or at the end of the sixth seal. That's the one we're talking about. But when you look over and you look at the earthquake around the seventh trumpet, there is that is a different earthquake. There are two separate earthquakes talked about in the book of Revelation. This first earthquake this is going to be that sets off the tribulation. It's going to give everybody a wake up call that we are in at the tribulation. You see down there in verse 17, it says, For that great day of wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? This is talking about the kings of the earth, the noblemen, the captains, the rich man and the poor man, the men of valor, pretty much the whole world realizing that we are right there at what they call the day of wrath 
all of that will occur after this great earthquake that's talked about in verse 12 and after the sun becomes black and after the moon becomes red you see in verse 13 there's also going to be some stars falling from heaven let me show you this over here in the third testament of the bible chapter 64 verse 38 it's also talking about a rain of stars hitting our planet this is one of the events that's prophesied all throughout scripture is that there's going to be some type of what we would call a meteor shower or something like that that's going to be right there at the beginning of the tribulation right before the tribulation kicks off or maybe it's the very start of the tribulation you can see in the third testament of the bible is talking about how there will be a new planet the scientists are going to discover a new planet and a lot of people have been aware that this planet has been coming for a while they call it planet x or nibiru you can look those up there's a lot of people who are searching for this new planet which promises to harm the earth well we can see in the third testament of the bible that we're not going to be struck by this planet before the tribulation starts but it is going to bring in a rain of stars that will illuminate our world you see there it says it will not bring disasters to humanity like how we believe that the dinosaurs were destroyed but only announce to men the coming of the new era so these showers these meteor shower i'll call it i'm not really sure what exactly it's going to be but instead of destroying our planet what it's going to do is let us know that the tribulation has started of course the tribulation is the transition into this new era that's being talked about here with the new era being the aquarian age we live now in the Piscean age and we are actually about to make a transition onto the Aquarian age. You guys have probably heard about this. If you haven't, you can actually look it up. So back over here at the book of Revelation, we see that this is what's being talked about in chapter 6 and verse 13. And the stars fell on the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when it is shaken by a strong wind. We can see that same thing talked about over there in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13. So we have all of these events that's taking a place, an earthquake, a meteor shower, the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood all indicating the beginning of the great tribulation because you see right there in verse 15 that's when all of the kings of the earth the nobles and the captains the rich man the men of valor the servants and the free man all hid themselves in the caves and in the mountains saying fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come all right Again, I say this is where we're at now. All of these events are what's up next. So then let me show you what happens after that over here in chapter 7. You can imagine all of those events happening all of a sudden. You know, it don't take long for an earthquake, for a meteor shower. Those events will probably last less than an hour. But then you can see over in chapter 7, after those events after that catastrophic event that wake-up call then you start to have the ceiling of the 144,000 so if you had your pencil out you would write that down this earthquake and this meteor shower followed by the ceiling of the 144,000 now notice right here because sometimes people leave this part out is down here in verse 9 when you see this great multitude now this right here is the rest of us. Sure you have these 144,000 that are sealed up there in the beginning of chapter 7. But don't forget about this multitude that no man can number. Because this makes up the rest of us. It is not only the 144,000 that will survive the tribulation. But many of us will be counted in this number here. This great multitude. Whereas the 144,000 would come from Israel. This multitude comes from all kindreds and nations and tribes and tongues. So this will be everybody. 
well I guess I shouldn't say everybody because when you look down here in verses 13 through 15 it kind of narrows it down to a certain group of people you remember in the story that the angel turns to John and say John who are all these people dressed in white who is this multitude that nobody can number and John pretty much say you know who they are I don't know who they are but you know who they are well then he goes on to explain to them they are who came from great affliction and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb all right so these are the people who have came through affliction and this is what a lot of you guys are in now by way of the poverty that you're going through the persecutions that you're going through and some of the other humiliating events that are taking place in your life now this is the affliction and this is also why I put this certain translation of the Bible up here of the book of Revelation this is actually coming from the Aramaic translation of the Bible because it uses the word affliction instead of tribulation and that's a big difference guys because you know at this part in the story the tribulation hasn't started already and so it is a big confusion when the King James Version uses the word tribulation because it implies that the tr that these people will emerge after the tribulation is over and that's just not the case we have been in affliction for a while you remember over there in Matthew 24 the Messiah described the beginning of sorrows where there's a lot of persecutions a lot of volcanoes a lot of earthquakes and a lot of other events that are actually afflicting people and so this multitude are they who would have come through that affliction clothed in white robes meaning that they are righteous meaning that they are obedient to the law that's important to grasp because there's a lot of misunderstandings related to the law the people in the left behind church that left behind religion they who are waiting for the great escape are planning that escape by rejecting the law and that's a good way to escape by rejecting the law because it is the law that is actually going to help us to survive the tribulation in the first place. So it's easy to see how they will end up being transitioned to the spirit world when they are rejecting the one thing that's supposed to help them stay in this world and survive the tribulation. Now we could do a whole class on these parts down here how it says they will hunger no more and thirst anymore. This is part of the afflictions that we're going through where the Father is helping us with that transition from relying on the beast systems for our food and the beast systems for our clothes and the beast systems to protect us from the heat we are having to make a transition over to his way of doing things and that is part of the affliction I could tell you firsthand our father's way of doing things and man's way of doing things are completely opposite it seems sometimes but let me jump down here in chapter 8 because now we want to talk about what a lot of people refer to as the rapture. I call it the great awakening because when you look over here at the definition of the word rapture in the Merriam-Webster dictionary at merriam you can see that there are at least three different definitions of the word rapture now of course there is the left behind definition of the word rapture which you don't find in any of the ancient dictionaries and that it is a final assumption of Christians into heaven during the end time according to Christian theology now they add these a whole lot of caveats in here and asterisks and different stuff to let you know that this definition has been added to the dictionary based on modern beliefs of what's actually going to take place the thing is there is some truth in this definition of the word you just have to look at it see how it says assumption of Christians into heaven well you've heard the old adage everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die well that's how you get to the heaven ain't it but anyway that's not the definition that I go by I go by the more traditional definition of the word rapture 
this one right here that says a mystical experience in which the spirit is exalted to a knowledge of divine things that is actually what is about to happen to us it's mystical in that it is a mystery and we don't really understand it we're all going to experience this at some point but it is going to have on an effect on our spirit our spirit is going to be exalted whereas now many of us don't even know we have a spirit man inside of us the spirit is going to be a awakened and it's going to be exalted to a knowledge of divine things which means that we're going to get closer to our father we're going to get closer to that spirit world we're going to be able to interact with angels and other beings in the spirit world we're going to be able to communicate with animals we're going to be able to recognize and understand our previous lifetimes a lot is going to go on during this time right here it's definitely going to be an expression or manifestation of ecstasy or passion well this is what's talked about over here in chapter 8 of the book of Revelation now it starts at the beginning of the seventh seal once the seventh seal has been opened that's when we're going to have this transition you can see some of this taking place in verses 2 and verses 3 when it's talking about this angel that shall stand before our father with seven trumpets he's actually going to be standing at the golden altar He's actually going to be standing at the incense altar, which is right before the throne on the other side of the curtain outside of the Holy of Holies. And he's going to be performing an incense burning, which is going to carry our prayers up to the Father. But if you look here in verse five, it's also talking about thunders and flashings and voices and an earthquake. But this is the same earthquake that we saw back there in chapter 6 so it is like these events happen simultaneously well let me show you back over here in the third testament of the bible in chapter 55 verse 7 says and when those chosen by me find themselves reunited around my law the earth and the stars will be shaken and in the sky there will be signs so what this is saying is that once the 144,000, which are those chosen by me, have received their sealing, which is what he's saying, reunited around my law, then the earth and the stars will be shaken, and in the sky there will be signs. So there's your earthquake, and there are your stars falling. And you also have the moon turning into blood, and the sun darkened right there with those signs. So let's make sense of this, understanding that the scripture is 100% correct. That's the beauty of the scripture is that you cannot find not one single error in it, period. Even if you try to look hard enough, all you're going to find is either translation errors or misunderstandings on our part because the Bible is the only unfallible thing on the planet. So let's make sense of this. Now, one thing we have to understand is how Revelation is made up of several parallel narratives, meaning it is the same story told over and over at least seven times. Some say it's the same story told over ten times. And that is what I believe we're seeing when we look at this transition statement right here at the beginning of chapter 7 when it says, And after these things I saw four messengers which stood at the four corners. You got to remember that this is John that's actually in this vision state here seeing all of these events take place before his eyes. Well, I believe what he's trying to tell us here is that he saw one thing occur up here which was at the end of the sixth seal with the earthquake and the stars falling from heaven and then we almost start the same story over again down here in chapter 7 this is what it means to be a parallel narrative is because he's going to tell us the same thing over again 
Now, those who are paying very close attention will say, OK, well, where is the ceiling of the hundred and forty four thousand in chapter six? Well, it is over here in the third testament that we get the understanding that the ceiling actually takes place in the sixth seal. That is basically what the sixth seal is about. That's why there's so many people talking about the Holy Spirit and the Elijah spirit. It's because of all of the things going on in the sixth seal, which also includes the selling of the 144,000. You see right here in chapter 38, which is pretty much all about the seven seals. You see right there in verse 64, it says, it is the sixth seal upon its unleashing, overflowing with its contents of wisdom, your spirit in a message of full justice, clarification and revelation. It is in the sixth seal that we get the fulfillment of a lot of ancient prophecies and forgotten promises. The arrival of the comforter means for you the opening of the sixth seal and the beginning of a new stage of the evolution of humanity. This is what the sixth seal has meant for those who love the Lord. Well, before we jump back over there to Revelations, let's look at this verse in chapter 55. Verse 70 says, do not be confused because before the closing of the sixth seal, great things shall happen. The heavenly bodies shall show great signs. The nations of the earth shall lament. And of this planet, three quarters shall disappear. And one quarter only shall remain in which the seed of the Holy Spirit shall grow as new life. This is talking about that great earthquake. See how great an earthquake we're talking about? When three quarters shall disappear and one quarter only will remain in which the seed of the Holy Spirit shall grow as new life. That's the biggest earthquake I ever heard of. So we jump back over here to the book of Revelations, understanding that at chapter seven, he's about to start telling us the same story over, just adding more elements to it. And what he's showing in chapter 7 is the selling of the 144,000 and the multitude that no man can number before the seventh seal opens there in chapter 8. And we can tell by the reference to the earthquake that some of this, what we see over here in the book of Revelation, is actually overlapping. So this is where we're at now, waiting for the appearance of this planet, waiting for this great earthquake, waiting for the stars to fall from heaven, which will all take place after the selling of the 144,000. Now, I always like to give you guys practical information over here on our channel. I mean, what good is it for you to know these events are going to take place if you don't know what you are supposed to be doing about it? So let me go ahead and show you this verse before I close out. And that's over here in the book of 2nd Esdras and chapter 2, I believe it is, where it's telling us how the servants of the Father are sealed at the Lord's feast. And so this is important why we keep the feast days is because those feast days are when we get our sealing. And of course, the next feast days coming up are the memorial of a blowing of trumpets and atonement day. One, if not both of which have not been fulfilled in Bible prophecy. So these promises to be big days. These could be the days that we actually see some of these events take place. But even if they don't, we have the mandatory feast of tabernacles or booths, which I've always said would be the perfect day to have a global earthquake since everybody is supposed to be sleeping in tents anyway. You got to remember that our father is everywhere. He knows everything and he is all powerful. And so it shouldn't be too hard to understand how he could have put all of his loyal followers in a tent during the time when we would have a global earthquake that destroyed two thirds of the planet. I don't know. It makes sense to me. Well, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. 
I'll probably end up doing this video again. This is the first time I've attempted to do this. And so I think it is a bit rough. And so I'll probably end up doing it again because I believe I can do a better job. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button if you haven't done so already. Leave us a comment and pray for us.